tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to Season 6, Episode 22 of Horror Hill. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and I need to start this episode by apologizing about the state of my voice. As you can probably hear, your good pal Eric has come down with a head cold. Don't worry, this isn't going to slow down the steady, pulsing flow of horror, but it does mean I'll sound a little different for an episode or two. Speaking of which, with tonight's episode, we'll be getting back to basics with nature. Tonight's story brings us to the Spring Hill Assisted Living Facility, where we are introduced to a woman named Loretta Hill, and she ain't your typical grandma. Join us as we witness an encounter between Loretta and Billy, one of the workers at the facility. Their ensuing relationship leads to some well, let's just say personal growth for everyone involved. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all of our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Did I mention they're ad-free? Thank you for your support. Now, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. And now, from author Eric Montag, I give you Mother Mushroom. Loretta Piper was new to Spring Hill Assisted Living, the facility where Billy Cosberg worked almost full-time as an aide, but it wasn't long before she cornered him. About three weeks into her brief stay, when he changed the sheets on her bed, she rolled her wheelchair over and shut the apartment door. So, she said as he put on a pillowcase, what do you sell? Billy stopped cold sell. Loretta nodded and waved her hand like he could tell the truth already. Meth? Coke? 
pot? Her other hand was already digging in the pocket of her red knit sweater. She freed some tissues, a Carmex, and a baggie of shriveled grapes. Without hesitation, she held the baggie out to him. Try one, she offered. Billy had no idea what to say. He did sell. In fact, he sold plenty. He had customers a hundred miles away, but Loretta didn't look like any customer that he had or wanted. He shook his head and looked toward the door. Loretta smiled broadly. There's a fine business opportunity here, Billy, if you've got the brains and balls for it. She rolled toward him by moving her wheelchair with her purple stocking feet. Her thin fingers still clutched the bag. What makes you think I'm interested? Billy asked. He eyed the baggie and saw that it contained little red mushrooms. You haven't got brains and balls? Loretta asked. Billy looked at her for a long time. He reached out and took the baggie, looking around as he did. He opened the baggie and sniffed. They smelled odd, but wonderful. A bit like bacon. Not what he would have expected from mushrooms. It would be crazy, he thought, to take a mushroom here at work. He never took meth and only smoked weed Thursdays through Sundays on account of his job. He had never even tried a mushroom. But before he knew it, a mushroom was in his mouth. He felt warm almost immediately. The warmth started in his gut and spread out over his body like warm arms sliding around him on a winter's day. He stood there for a moment, chewing slowly and thinking things over. Even his teeth began to warm. Those shrooms sell for 30 bucks a piece, Loretta said. Bullshit, he said and licked his teeth. Want to give them back then? Loretta asked. No, he did not want to return them, and she saw that. The warmth was settling into his groin, and it felt awesome. Take the baggie home, enjoy yourself, and share with that special lady in your life. Stop by tomorrow. She winked at him, still smiling. She looked like a woman who had probably sold many used cars in her prime. He took the baggie home and told Kelsey, his fiance, to try a couple. She did. He tried two more. Then they had incredible championship marathon sex and passed out. When he awoke, he was sure of two things. He needed more mushrooms, and he could sell them for at least $35 each around here, probably 50 in Minneapolis or Milwaukee. He went to visit Loretta, closing the door himself this time. He handed what was left of the baggie back to her, although it pained him to do it. He had kept ten mushrooms in a little baggie of his own at home. I could maybe sell these, I don't know. How much do you have? Loretta accepted the baggie and dropped it into her lap like it didn't mean a thing. This baggie, she said. That's it? Billy said. You want to do business for half a baggie of mushrooms at 20 bucks a piece? I'm not running a garage sale. I need more than a baggie. I need flow, constant flow. He hoped she had not wasted his time. He had already called his buddy Steve to come and check out the mushrooms that he still had at home. Steve was from Superior and had connections throughout Canada. If Steve liked them as much as he did, they could sell every mushroom this woman had. Have to grow more, she replied. Grow more, Billy snapped. And how do I do that? Do I look like a guy that grows mushrooms for fun? Loretta beamed. No, she said. But you do look like a guy who wants not to work here anymore. You're going to need a business partner. It will need to be someone who doesn't realize that he's your business partner. Someone dispensable. You're losing me here, Loretta, Billy said. 
Loretta reached into her red sweater and pulled out a small glass jar, perhaps an old makeup container. Inside it was a small, shriveled, black thing. She held it out in his direction in the palm of her hand. He walked over and took it. What's this? The mother mushroom. Loretta whispered as though she might be overheard. Do not open the lid until you're ready to take it out. Do not smell it. Do not touch it with your bare hands. Do not eat it yourself. Lots of rules, Loretta. Billy examined it. What happens to the person who eats it? Do they become my mushroom-picking zombie slave? The mushrooms need a place to grow, Loretta said. She was not joking. She was not smiling. The red mushrooms grow on the people who eat the black mushroom? Is that what you're selling me here? Loretta nodded. The mushrooms that we ate grew on someone? He nearly tossed the little glass jar back in her face. Except his fingers didn't want to let the little jar go. What's in all this for you? He asked. Why do you care what I do with these mushrooms? You will pay me ten dollars for each mushroom you sell or eat, and when the black mother mushroom grows again, she said and tapped her fuzzy gray head, you'll let me know immediately, not the next time you work or the next day. Call me here immediately. This episode of Horror Hill is brought to you by Green Chef. Eric, thanks for having me over for dinner, friend. What are we having? Hey, it's my pleasure. I whipped us up a little beef tenderloin and garden couscous salad. Ooh, that sounds great. It smells even better. I'm surprised you had time to go to the store and make all this today. It was no trouble. I had it delivered. It's quicker and cleaner. I'm trying out one of my favorite meal kit dinners tonight. Green Chef is the most sustainable meal kit and the only meal kit that's both carbon and plastic offset. They offset 100% of our carbon footprint as well as 100% of the plastic in every box. You're reducing your food waste by at least 25% versus grocery shopping. Oh, you mean like HelloFresh? No, although Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh. And with a wider array of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. I love switching between the brands, and now my listeners can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. With Green Chef, you can expect elevated fare of a consistent top-notch quality, featuring premium ingredients and sustainably sourced produce. With time-saving recipes packed with fresh produce and vibrant flavors, Green Chef helps you make the most out of those long summer days. Well, hopefully there aren't too many of those left. It's been a scorcher of the season. I hear that, but I also love how easy it is. Thinking about what to make for dinner can be a bone of contention in any household, especially with little ones. Let Green Chef decide for you. With over 24 recipes that change weekly, variety is always available. All right, all right, all right. I'm sold. Can we eat now? Go to greenchef.com slash horror135 and use code horror135 to get $135 off across five boxes, plus free shipping on your first box. That's Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. Because when you eat well, you feel well. Billy wondered how she would enforce that. Whoever eats this mother mushroom will die then. Loretta shook her head. Eventually, but not for quite a while. Billy held the jar up and looked at it. The mushroom inside looked like a tiny mummified fairy corpse. Who would he choose? He had no idea. 
He was not the killing kind, but he could offer it to someone. No one would have to take it from him if he offered it. And if someone took it and died, that would be their fault, not his. He couldn't save everybody who wanted to eat unknown objects. I'll be back tomorrow, he said, dropping Mother Mushroom into his pocket. He was only two hours into his shift, but he told his boss that he was sick and had to go home. He wanted to talk to Kelsey. When he pulled up in the driveway of the trailer house that he shared with Kelsey, he saw that Steve's car was already there. Steve wasn't supposed to be there until after supper. Billy walked into the kitchen and saw that the baggie of mushrooms was open. Half of them were gone. He walked through the kitchen into the hallway, where he immediately noticed their bedroom door was open. Steve was having sex with Kelsey on their bedroom floor. From where he stood, neither of them even saw him. They were too busy grunting like animals. Billy could barely see part of a dragon tattoo that Steve had on his shoulder as he lay atop her. Billy's heart filled with cement. He stood there for what seemed like ages and then turned around and walked back into the kitchen. He walked past the kitchen knives, past the junk drawer with the hammer, and out to his car. His gun was waiting patiently in his glove compartment, but as he dug in his pocket for his car keys, his fingers brushed Mother Mushroom's jar. Billy left and spent the day walking in the woods. He returned home at four o'clock, his standard time. Kelsey was gone to work by then. He helped himself to some supper. Then he stood at his bedroom door, staring down at the floor, and wondered how long this had been going on. He had known Steve for almost four years now. He had been with Kelsey for five. Five years down the toilet with nothing to show for it. She had already picked out a reception hall for their wedding. She had baby names picked out. He even had a few names of his own in mind. Maybe today was the first time. Maybe the mushrooms had made her do it. Maybe Steve had taken advantage of her shroom-induced horniness. Last night, when she had eaten her mushrooms, she had also told him about the warm arms on her body. She had even described the warmness for him during sex. When Steve arrived at 7.30, he apologized for being late, said he had gotten a late start. Billy told the lying bastard that his tardiness was perfectly okie-dokie. However, Billy saw that Steve's eyes went directly to the baggie of mushrooms on the kitchen table. It was almost as though he had seen them before and knew exactly where they would be. Billy picked up the bag of mushrooms and went to the living room. So, who did you get these from? Steve asked. A friend, Billy replied. I'm pretty excited about them, and I know you will be too once you try them. I thought they could go to Minneapolis or maybe Toronto. When he turned to look at Steve, he saw how wide Steve's eyes were as he looked at the baggie dangling from Billy's hand. He looked like a cat watching a mouse. Steve nodded. I've had some good ones. I bet you have, Billy said, and handed the baggie over. Help yourself. I'll get you a chaser. Billy returned to the kitchen and grabbed a Bud Light from the fridge. He always kept Bud Light on hand for when Steve came down. Billy was prepared for his friend's visits, although probably not as prepared as Kelsey. He opened the beer, tossed the cap aside, and then thought about unzipping his pants and rubbing his balls on the mouth of the bottle before returning to the living room. Maybe he'd save that treat for Steve's second beer. Billy watched Steve eat two little red mushrooms, one after another, almost as though he knew how they would affect him. God, these are good! Steve drained the bud. They're like fire running everywhere under my skin! Everywhere! Even my nuts! 
Billy asked Steve some business questions and how much he was moving over the Canadian border. Steve's answers were mostly vague and unhelpful. Steve asked a lot of questions about where Billy had managed to find a friend that had such beautiful mushrooms. Billy's answers were also vague and unhelpful. When Steve was high and smiling from ear to ear, Billy decided to invite Mother Mushroom to the party. He reached into his jeans pocket and pulled out the little glass jar. The red ones are good, really good, but you know what's even better? The black ones. Steve eyed the jar, his eyes shaking in his skull, and Billy knew immediately that he wouldn't have to push very hard to make this happen. Steve held out his hand. I'll be able to sell these, he said. He held up the jar with the black mushroom inside. Wow, this is ugly. Try it, Billy offered. It makes the red ones look like Cheetos. You've had one? Steve asked. He unscrewed the top of the jar. Billy's answer to Steve's question would not have mattered at all, but he lied anyway. Yup. And like that, Mother Mushroom was in Steve's hand, and then it was in his mouth and gone. A thought occurred to Billy then that had honestly never occurred to him before. It was foolish to put something in your body when you didn't understand it and it further occurred to Billy that he had made a living by convincing people to do this very thing. I'm going to have to crash here, Steve said. Absolutely, Billy agreed and almost laughed. I couldn't let you leave now. I'll be gone in the morning. They talked for a while. Billy agreed to get as many mushrooms as he could. Steve agreed to sell them. They agreed on $40 per mushroom, 60 in the cities. They watched South Park. Billy gave Steve more beer, only unzipping his pants and rubbing his balls on the mouth of the third one. Steve drank and eventually passed out. Billy sat in his chair and watched Steve lie on the couch and sleep. Kelsey would be home at 11.30 when her shift ended. Maybe he would go to bed then. Perhaps he would stay out here and keep an eye on Steve. He wanted to see what would happen. Maybe Loretta was going to put one over on him. Maybe Mother Mushroom wasn't going to do anything. Kelsey came home at her usual time. She noticed Steve and asked if he was drunk. Billy replied that he was and was going to stay overnight. Kelsey helped herself to the last remaining mushroom in the bag. She asked if he wanted to come to bed too, and Billy knew she wanted to have sex. He told her that his head was pounding and he didn't want to. She looked shocked and a little angry that he said no. She had always loved sex, and he could count on one hand how many times he had turned her down over the last five years, but he very much wanted to keep an eye on Steve. That, and he suspected very strongly that it was the mushrooms talking. The mushrooms made people super horny. It was as simple as that. And that was why they would sell. He could be 300 pounds, toothless, hairy, and with half a sandwich lost in his belly button, and she would still be throwing herself at him. Billy ignored Kelsey's pouting as she went to bed and then sat in his chair and watched Steve sleep. He wondered if the mushrooms would be useful to guys who couldn't get boners. He supposed they might be. He would have to ask Loretta that. If so, they could charge a lot more than $60 a mushroom. He could run them right out of Spring Hill. It took about two hours for Steve to do anything noteworthy. At first, he seemed restless in his sleep and tossed and turned, so he faced away from the end table lamp next to his head. Then he turned his face down so it was away from the light. About twenty minutes later he awoke, or at least his eyes opened. Billy, who was beginning to become groggy himself, took notice. Steve let out a deep sigh and sat up on the couch. 
He covered the side of his face closest to the lamp with both hands. His eyes were fixed directly on Billy, who didn't move or ask questions. Steve was sleepwalking. Steve got up and shuffled slowly to the closet in the hallway. Billy followed him and watched as Steve opened the closet door, went inside, and closed it behind him. He did all of this without saying anything or acknowledging Billy. Billy called Steve's name twice, but there was no answer inside the closet. Billy opened the closet door, and Steve's hand immediately shot out, grabbed the doorknob, and closed the door again. Billy debated going to work or staying home to watch Steve in the morning. He checked in on his business partner and saw that he was sitting on the closet floor with his back against a wall. Billy knew something was not good when he realized that Steve had crapped his pants overnight and was now sitting in his filth. His eyes were also open, staring at a vacuum cleaner with no interest. Billy said Steve's name, but there was no response. Steve did bring a hand up to shield his face from the hallway light as Billy stood with the door open. Steve's skin was pale and blotchy. Billy nudged him with his foot. No response. He kicked Steve in the ribs. No response. I know about you and Kelsey, Billy whispered. No response. Not so much as a glance. Billy realized he should have been happy, but didn't feel happy. He felt afraid. He had to leave and talk to Loretta. Kelsey had to go into work early today, and he prayed to God that she wouldn't open the closet door after he was gone. I gave Mother Mushroom to someone, Billy said as he shut Loretta's door. He's sitting in my closet at home now, staring at my vacuum cleaner. He's made a mess of himself. Loretta nodded as though it was the most natural thing in the world. He will like the dark now. The darker, the better. Especially after he starts sprouting. Any sign of Mother Mushroom yet on the top of his head? He'll be alive while he sprouts these mushrooms? Yes. The farmer needs to remain alive. That's important. So don't kill him. Any sign of Mother Mushroom yet? No. When is the sprouting going to happen? If he's in the dark, it may already be happening, Loretta said. You may be able to harvest a few small ones tonight. In the next few days, you'll have a lot more. If he's a big guy, you may have hundreds. Hundreds? Billy repeated. Like how many hundreds? I've seen some folks grow as many as 1,500 or 2,000 shrooms on one farmer. Billy let his fear and panic take a break and did the math. Using Minneapolis prices of $60 a piece would make Steve worth 120 grand. Steve the farmer. Damn right he was. Grow on, Steve. How do I get the mushrooms off of him? Scissors, Loretta said with a shrug. That's what I've always used. You are a brutal bitch, Billy said. But he said it with a smile and a laugh, as it was now fair to say that he was warming to Loretta a bit. A hundred and twenty grand will do that to a person, he supposed. How many times have you done this? Well, after I got Mother Mushroom, I quit my job, I can tell you that much. Loretta smiled back at him. Of course, I like to spend money too, so I'll need you not to forget to pay me the ten dollars per mushroom once you've harvested them. The smile faded and then disappeared. And I'll also need you to remember that you must call me immediately when Mother Mushroom appears. You need to know nothing more important than that. Old Mother gets strong fast. Sure, of course, Billy said. There was no way he would give back Mother Mushroom. No way in hell. Not when it could turn a sack of crap like Steve into over a hundred grand. 
As soon as she... I mean, as soon as it starts to grow, as you said. Can't I just cut the black mushroom off, find another person immediately, and start the process over? Did I stutter? Loretta snapped, and Billy found himself taking a step back from the little old lady in the wheelchair. I will deal with her. She leaned forward in her chair and then stood up. She was tall, very tall for a woman, over six feet at least. Don't ignore me when I speak to you, and don't fuck with me, she said. The graveyard's full of people who fucked with me. She rubbed her fingers together, and Billy thought he smelled something burning for a second. Something electrical. Then her fingers spasmed out as though she had been shocked, and she fell back down into her wheelchair. She was desperate, which only made Billy more sure that he would never bring Mother Mushroom back. Fine, he agreed and nodded. He thought that he should probably bring a knife or something the next time he visited Loretta. He could hardly wait to get home, and when he did, he went right to the hallway closet. Steve shrunk back from the light, but otherwise did not acknowledge him. There was a small mushroom growing on the back of Steve's right hand. Billy poked the mushroom with his finger. Yup, it felt mushroomy to him. Steve didn't react at all. Billy gripped the little mushroom by its stem and tugged at it. It stayed rooted to the skin. Billy already had the scissors from the kitchen and he used them. The mushroom cut free quickly enough, and there was hardly any blood at all. He dropped it into a little baggie. Steve only blinked and made no other movement. Another one was growing on Steve's neck, so Billy snipped it off. Again, there was only a tiny bit of blood. He found Steve's stench challenging to tolerate as he worked closely with Steve. He stunk the whole area as he appeared to have self-fertilized several times. Kelsey was terrible at keeping house, but she would probably notice the smell of human waste in their hallway, and he had to get rid of Steve's car before she got home. He only had about an hour. He moved Steve's car out of the driveway and behind the garage, where Kelsey would never see it. As he walked back up to the trailer, he looked at the panel that blocked the crawl space beneath their trailer and had an idea. He went back inside and returned to the closet. How about we go for a walk, Steve? Let's find a nice dark place for you, Billy said. He tugged at Steve's shirt. If he couldn't get Steve to stand up on his own, this would become a problem. Steve was too heavy to carry. But, as luck would have it, the Lord's face shined down upon his efforts, and Steve reluctantly stood up. He took Steve and guided him down the hallway like an overgrown child. He remembered his crack about whoever ate the mushroom turning into his mushroom-picking zombie slave. As it turned out, he had been mostly right about that. The only difference was that he had a mushroom-growing zombie slave. Billy and his zombie slave walked hand in hand out the door. The sky was overcast and thunderclouds were coming. The sun wasn't bright, but Steve did not like it. He moaned, put his free hand up to cover his head, and shuffled a little faster toward the panel that covered the trailer's crawl space. Billy made him stop just long enough to snip three more decent-sized mushrooms off Steve's neck. Then he took the scissors and cut through the back of Steve's shirt. The shirt fell away. Steve's body was a lot nicer than Billy's. He was well-muscled, with a dragon tattoo that looked like it was riding his left shoulder. Billy had seen that dragon yesterday when he saw Steve and Kelsey in the bedroom. The dragon had a nice mushroom growing on its ass, and Billy snipped it off before gently guiding Steve down and into the hole that led to the dark beneath the trailer house. You'll be an excellent farmer, Billy said, and replaced the panel. Then he went into the house, scrubbed out the closet floor, and hung a citrus car air freshener from the coat rack. 
he got done just before Kelsey got home. Later, Billy surprised her with some unexpected mushrooms he knew she liked. He offered her the one from the ass of Steve's dragon first, and she was delighted. He even enjoyed one himself. Then they got down to business. The sex was good, but not as great as before since he no longer loved her. He wondered if she loved him, and discovered that he couldn't remember her last saying so. How had he not noticed before now? The following day was his day off, so he stayed home while Kelsey returned. After breakfast, he decided to go down to check on his farmer. He took a flashlight and crawled into the crawl space. After shining the flashlight around, he saw that Steve was curled up in the center of the crawl space, where he was farthest away from any crack of light. His back was covered in mushrooms. The dragon tattoo was so distorted that it was unrecognizable. Steve faced away from the light and remained unflinching as Billy set to harvesting the mushrooms. When he had two baggies worth, he stopped and looked at what he had done. Even though cutting away the mushrooms didn't cause much bleeding, cutting away so many had messed up Steve's back. His skin was a mass of bleeding craters and mushroom stumps. Billy didn't linger too long. Steve still stunk severely, although he did take the time to use the scissors to cut through the belt at Steve's waist. Then he cut through the pants. Yes, Steve was a mess, but mushrooms were growing on his buttocks. They were smeared with Steve's filth, so he would probably have to reduce the price on those when it came time to harvest, or wash them off and feed them to Kelsey. Billy called Nick, a buddy of his that sometimes ran meth in Milwaukee, and set up a time to meet downtown. Usually, Billy would have met Nick at his own house, but he wanted to get away for a bit. He kept feeling like he could hear Steve's breathing under the floor. Before leaving the house, he had even heard Steve's phone ringing, and he had made a mental note to go down and get it when he got home. He didn't like going under the house when it was dark, but he didn't want that phone ringing where Kelsey could hear it. The power would die on it eventually, but who knew when that would be? Billy gave Nick two mushrooms to try, and Nick seemed to fall in love with him almost immediately, just as he and Steve had done. Then he gave Nick a baggie filled with exactly 50 mushrooms. After some haggling, Nick paid him $36 apiece for a total of $1,800. Nick paid $900 then and agreed to pay another $900 when they were sold. Billy took his cash and went home. He thought more about bonerless older men. How could he market to them? He knew there were some guys at Spring Hill who would pay. He was sure of that. He could start there. He got home and saw that Kelsey wasn't there. She was off work tonight, but her car was in the driveway. The door was also unlocked. Billy looked around for her, and his sense of dread grew as he did. When he returned to the kitchen, he saw that her phone was sitting on the dining room table. He knew her password and unlocked it. Her screen displayed a message saying that a call placed to Stephanie had ended. It also showed that Stephanie had the same phone number as Steve. Billy hurled the phone against the refrigerator, and it shattered. When it shattered, he heard a noise from the other room. Billy left the kitchen and went down the hall. He heard another noise, a grunting. The bedroom was dark. He flipped on the light, but nothing happened. Kelsey? He asked. There was a faint, gurgling moan. He went back and turned on the hallway light and then came back to the open bedroom door. The light from the hallway illuminated the floor where Billy had seen Kelsey and Steve having sex the day before. It also illuminated Kelsey's feet poking out from beneath the bed. She looked like a mechanic working on a car. Her feet were moving unnaturally 
as though something was pressing on the rest of her body to make them move. There was a slurping noise, and then a noise like someone trying to talk with a mouthful of food. Kelsey, get up, Billy said, and stepped forward. From the other side of the bed, Steve stood up. He was nude and covered with dirt and mushrooms. The mushrooms were so thick that they were like rocky armor. The dragon on his shoulder was bloated, cancerous, and bursting with mushrooms. Steve's face was in shadow, but Billy did manage to see a little black horn at the top of Steve's head. Of course, Mother Mushroom. It rode Steve as a little person might ride an elephant. Billy turned and ran, crashing into the other side of the hallway and the kitchen. He rounded the table and glanced back. Steve was in the hallway, his hand reaching up to smash the hallway light by the ceiling. Before he did, Billy could see the roots growing out of Steve's head. Thin roots erupted from his skin and buried themselves in Steve's eyes lips, ears, and nose. Steve's face was coated with blood. Then, it was lights out. Billy made it to the door, threw it open, and went through, slamming it behind him again. Behind him, the kitchen lights went out, and the house was in total darkness. He ran to his car, opened the door, got in, and dug out his keys. He started the car, reached down, and opened the glove compartment to get his gun. That was when his windshield exploded inward. It was early evening, and the sun was already sliding down into the woods when the towering woman, who was sometimes Loretta Piper and sometimes someone else, parked her black Mustang behind Billy Cosberg's Impala and got out. She took her gun and her walking stick with her. Her old heart was beginning to pick up speed, and it kicked into high gear when she walked around and saw that the door to Billy's Impala was wide open. The driveway was dirt, and Loretta could see that there had been a struggle. And, of course, there was a trail where something had been drug back toward the trailer house. Her pace quickened as she knew that Mother Mushroom was close possibly watching her even now. She had no idea who Billy had given Mother Mushroom to, but they were likely to be mighty strong by now. Mother Mushroom made her farmers strong and dulled their nerves so they could no longer feel pain. Mother's farmers would go anywhere she wanted them to and do anything she wanted them to do. This had been a problem during the last five times she had tracked down and killed Mother Mushroom. Mother Mushroom had not spoken even once, no matter what Loretta did to the farmer that she was riding. And Loretta had done terrible things. Loretta checked again to ensure that the safety of her gun was off. She hated the gun, but it had become necessary over the last few years as her power slowly faded away. Even as little as five years ago, she would have felt the crackle of lightning between her splayed fingers and would have made short work of this whole business. But that was not the way anymore. Now she had to carry a gun like every other old lady. She rounded the corner of the trailer house and immediately saw where she needed to go. A panel had been pulled away from the trailer's base, and now the crawl space beneath the house was open. Are you tired of playing the Hunger Game? You know the one. The, hey, what do you want for dinner game? The one where there never seems to be a winner or loser. Well, now Green Chef has your back on that. With Green Chef, you can expect elevated fare of a consistent top-notch quality, featuring premium ingredients and sustainably sourced produce. Green Chef now offers more variety and flexibility than ever before with double the choices. Families are more likely to eat healthier food cooked at home if they have the ingredients readily available. 
Green Chef brings you healthy, delicious meals to your doorstep, complete with instructions and portioned ingredients. Well, what if your diet's atypical? You know I'm a meat eater. Members of the household eat differently? Now you can order meals to suit every lifestyle. Vegan, vegetarian, keto plus paleo, Mediterranean, fast and fit, and gluten-free, all in one box. Well, that's good. Oh, wow. This is really tasty. Exciting and delicious meals also help support a healthy lifestyle. Green Chef keeps mealtime interesting without sacrificing taste. Green Chef's expert chefs curate every recipe so you can enjoy restaurant quality dishes at home without compromising flavor. Some of my favorite Green Chef recipes include the delectable steak butternut squash salad and the luscious lemon basil caper pork. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well with dinners that work for you, not the other way around. As the only keto meal kit, Green Chef makes sticking to a well, carb-conscious lifestyle easier. It's never been easier to eat better. So what are you waiting for? Go to greenchef.com slash horror135 and use code horror135 to get $135 off across five boxes, plus free shipping on your first box. That's Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. Because when you eat well, you feel well. The trail in the dirt led to that opening. As Loretta came forward, she belched loudly. It would have sounded like a belch to anyone nearby, but a word of summoning would compel Mother Mushroom to show herself. It was the only helpful power that Loretta had to use, and even using it once made her head swim. She had become so disgustingly weak. A face appeared in the opening to the crawl space. It was almost certainly a man. It was overrun with mushrooms, so only the faintest traces of eyes, ears, nose, and mouth remained. Loretta seized her moment, just as she had done in the previous times. Old mother, I have provided you willing blood and meat. I have come before you for payment as is my due." The farmer shuffled forward from the dark hole, and the trailer gave birth to Mother Mushroom's newest farmer. Loretta could see roots that grew out of the skull dragging along the ground as the head dipped low to make clearance for the giant black mushroom that grew out of its head. As the body came forward, she could see a massive tangle of roots that burst out of the back of the farmer's skull and wound back into the darkness. The creature came forward and stood up. The farmer was indeed a man. There was a cluster of mushrooms hanging down between his legs. Loretta raised the gun and pointed it at the farmer's hip. If it rushed toward her, she wanted to knock it down. As she had the last five times, Loretta began, My power has fled, old mother, and I want it back. In all the previous times, Mother Mushroom had never answered her, only stood before her, smiling as Loretta resorted to violence to get her to speak. Loretta knew that she had made mistakes in Mother's past incarnations. The meat and blood had been captive rather than willing, or the body too old and sick to make a useful farmer for Mother Mushroom, or too young to withstand the growth of the mother's children. But now, Loretta was confident that she had committed no oversight. She had followed instructions to the letter. Mother Mushroom would have to speak and tell her what she wanted to know this time. Fairy law required it. And even Mother Mushroom, a queen among the fairies, would not have the power to refuse. The trap was flawless, and it had sprung. The farmer began to smile and looked her slowly up and down. When he smiled, 
two of his teeth fell out and plopped to his feet. Then he raised a hand and made a gesture like he was telling her to settle down and relax. She would finally get what she was due. He opened his mouth and Loretta's proper name came out in a low croak, like a squished, deflating frog. Bug. Catherine Bug. First you must. Loretta's pulse quickened. She took a breath and listened carefully. Find me some paper and ink. Paper and ink? Loretta said. What are you? The farmer's tongue slid out between his pink lips and his jaw closed. Blood ran down the farmer's chin in streams as the farmer kept biting down. More blood came and the farmer looked like he began to chew. All the while, he still had a smile on his face. The visible part of his tongue tumbled forward and hung from his mouth by a flap of flesh. Loretta was overcome with fury. She blew a hole in the farmer's hip with one shot and then put a hole in the center of his crotch with the next shot. The farmer went down. Loretta staggered forward, cussing and repeating incantations that would bring down the lightning, boil a man's blood where he stood, make a man feel like he was being stung to death by invisible bees, drive a man mad when he looked into the darkness of his own shadow. But none of her old incantations did a thing. What power their words had withered and died in the air that she breathed. The farmer on the ground laughed until he choked. Loretta rushed forward and kicked him squarely in the side of the head. A part of her warned against approaching the farmer, but she didn't listen. She couldn't listen. She was just so angry. All she wanted to do was break the farmer's jaw so it wouldn't be able to laugh anymore. She did break the farmer's jaw. She kicked him so hard that she caved in his face, but that didn't stop his arm from flying forward and gripping her leg. She lowered her gun, putting a bullet through the farmer's arm. Chunks of mushrooms, flesh, and bone went flying, and then the other arm came out and grabbed her other leg. The next moment she came down, and pain exploded through her legs. Her hip shrieked in agony. She held her walking stick and brought it down on top of the black mushroom that jiggled atop the farmer's head. Part of the mushroom cap fell off, but Loretta didn't wait. Her other arm was already raising the gun to the farmer's face. She pulled the trigger and the right side of the farmer's face exploded. The farmer's arm shuddered and his hands clamped down harder. Loretta felt something in her ankles break, the left and the right. She didn't wait. She dropped her stick, steadied her gun again with both hands, and put another bullet in the farmer's lower chin. The farmer's head went down. His arms went slack, and the black mushroom on his head tipped forward to rest on the ground. Loretta was breathing hard, harder than she ever had. She hurt everywhere. She hurt so much that she couldn't even concentrate on crying. Her lips, hip, butt, and now, slowly, a pain sharpening in her arm. She leaned back, dropped against the ground, and then turned and threw up. She saw it then. A face in the trailer's window. More than a face. A half-naked man with roots climbing up through his chest hair and then plunging into the bottom of his jaw. Roots spilled out of his temples, winding around to burrow in again near his lips and eyes. The face was not too mangled for her to tell that it was Billy. She saw it all and lay still, 
stunned as she watched him raise a gun and point it down through the open window. Then she raised her gun slowly, but Billy shot the hand that held the gun, and then her gun was gone. Billy! Loretta screamed and pulled her destroyed hand down to her chest, covering it with her other good hand. One of her fingers was pulverized from the look of it. Bog, Billy croaked. Catherine Bog, you old crone. Off to her right, Loretta could hear a shuffling noise. She turned and saw something else crawling forward from the darkness beneath the trailer. It was another human, with roots growing into its head. It was a woman with long hair that draped down to cover her face and roots piercing her scalp. Those roots came from the back of the farmer's head. The woman crawled slowly and breathed very loudly. She was impossibly thin and skeletal, with skin draping off her body like loose-fitting clothing. She did not look up, but she moved straight towards Loretta. Loretta had never read about Mother Mushroom having more than one farmer at a time, but she supposed there was a first time for everything. Loretta removed her good hand from her shattered right hand and reached over as best she could to try and claw the black mushroom off the farmer's head. She was nowhere near close. Billy's voice came down like a fog that settled over her. Blood is the answer, Catherine. You need blood to get your power back, and I need blood to raise my children. Together, we shall find blood. Great rivers of it. And we will drink our fill. You will be powerful, and I will be many. When the crawling woman reached Loretta, she took hold of her leg and yanked her closer to the motionless farmer. Loretta lost herself and screamed. She repeated every incantation that she knew, willing the body of the crawling woman to blow apart in any number of ways, but none of them worked. Loretta screamed like an animal, like she had never done before in her 211 years. And then, the woman looked up, and Loretta could see that roots had sewn her mouth shut, and her eyes were so sunken and miserable that Loretta knew at once that whoever the woman was, whoever she had been, she was still inside her body. Her face was filthy, with tear streaks in the dirt, and something had been chewing on her ears. She grabbed Loretta by the hair and pulled her head down to where the black mushroom rested against the ground at the top of the farmer's head. She pulled so hard that Loretta felt the mushroom's skin press against her lips. The mushroom was warm and pulsing, drinking deeply of whatever was inside the farmer's head. Loretta was terrified and struggled against the crawling woman's iron grip because she knew what her end would be. She knew what Mother Mushroom wanted. She wanted what she had never had. A witch farmer. But she also knew that Mother Mushroom smelled wonderful. Like blood and sun and sex and life. And, yes... Bacon. In moments, thin roots rose off the farmer's body and began to slide toward her, the woman who sometimes was Loretta Piper and sometimes someone else. Still, as always, Catherine Bogg found herself unable to resist opening her mouth. You've been listening to Mother Mushroom by Eric Montag. 
Eric is the author of several dark short stories, including the short story collection Mad Dreams. His most recent dark short stories include Thinning the Herd, which won third place at the Milwaukee Paranormal Conference, Cult of Weird.com 2016 Summer Writing Contest, and Anything, which was featured in the 2017 edition of Creative Wisconsin. And now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Taking a quick break here to show some love to a sponsor that's shown so much to us, BetterHelp Online Therapy. I've got a scenario for you. How well would you take care of your car if you had to keep the same one your entire life? You'd probably be keeping it pristine, right? So why aren't we putting that same effort and care into our mental health? I admit that in my younger years, checking in on my mental health wasn't something I thought about much, if at all, really. But it turns out, how we care for our minds affects how we experience life. So it's important to invest time and care into keeping them healthy. There are plenty of ways to support a healthy brain, like learning a new language or skill. However, there's also BetterHelp Online Therapy. BetterHelp is online therapy that'll help you deal with life's difficulties quickly, conveniently, and inexpensively. It's helped me through countless situations. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with a therapist who specializes in your unique difficulties. Whether it be grief, stress, anxiety, fear, depression, etc. You can text anytime and schedule calls or Zoom meetings weekly. With BetterHelp, help is never more than a text away. It's professional counseling in your pocket. Horror Hill podcast listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash horror hill. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash horror hill. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and I'll see you right here at this same time next week for more terrifying tales, sinister stories, and frightening fables. All that good stuff. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted by, and its featured tale performed by, yours truly, Eric Peabody. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda. Finalization by Craig Groshek and S.K. Brown. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? I do take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, please subscribe to us to make sure that you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect any time and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing and leave a kind comment. Lastly, don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. 
In addition to helping us out, you will get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, you can hear more of my work on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. However, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.